Good morning. Welcome to our online service for April 5th. Um, thank you all for joining us here this morning at Clearwater Baptist Church. I urge you all to get your Bibles out now. Um, hopefully you guys may have been participating in some songs beforehand or sing some songs after, but try to make it as much as a, 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 as a worship service as you can with your family. Um, I've got a few announcements here that I'll run through, kind of having to do with Awana and Easter. I've got my Awana shirt on already. Um, in a few hours, we'll start listening to sections again. That's really exciting for me. Um, and I know you, the kids out there are excited. The leaders are ready to, to listen. We did some testing yesterday, so it should be a lot of fun. Starting at 2 o'clock will be the leaders, kids. Um, that's not because we're giving them preferential treatment. It's just so we can work out any extra bugs before we start at 3 o'clock for Sparky's, 4 o'clock for TNT, and then 5 o'clock for the teens trek and journey. So I'll be available, Melody, um, also Amy and Ashley and Haley, along with Monica and Rick, and Missouri. Um, that's our listening team. Reach out to any of us via Facebook message or text or call and or refer back to the, the email slash text slash Facebook posts that we sent out on uh, Friday. So we're looking forward to it. And even if you don't have a bunch of sections ready in your book, go ahead and reach out to us. We want to see you clubbers. And uh, yeah, so just, just give us a video call or just even a call on the phone would be fun. So, um, and it's banana night tonight. So if you've got bananas around the house, break them out. Um, we're not doing the character qualities and we're not doing like the normal check-in stuff, but it'll be fun um, if you want to participate for the theme night. Um, so that's what I've got for Awana. We're going to listen tonight on the 5th and then we're also going to listen again on the 19th. Um, we, won't, we won't listen on Easter. We'll have, most people have other stuff going on. It's not a normal club night. So then for Easter, you've probably seen some of the posts that I put out there. We've got a great program planned. We're going to have uh, some specials. We're going to have messages from families. So if, if, you're, if you want to have a message that will be at the end of the program, um, please email that to me. You'll see my email address right here. And uh, email that to me or Facebook message it to me. And we'll get that at the end of the program. And just something like, hi, from our family, happy Easter. We love you. We can't wait to see you and worship with you. Just something like that would be fine. And then, so I, as many of those as possible, it would be great, it'll be a great addition to the program. And then kind of going backwards in it, you know, Glenn will have a, an Easter sermon, and there will be a few specials in there, but then start, and that'll all start at 11 o'clock. But at 10 o'clock is, we'll have four hymns, and you, you can go to the Facebook post and see those hymns, they're all kind of Easter hymns, and... Uh, Brandon, we're going to have that pre-recorded, and Brandon and Nikki are going to lead everybody in song. We'll also have the piano player in here, so right at 10 o'clock, the, the video will be available on Facebook. It'll come on Facebook Live right at 10, and then it'll also be available on YouTube right at 10. So you can hit play right at 10 o'clock, and follow along. We'll do a little bit of introduction, and then tell everybody to get their boots on and go outside. And then we'll go one, two, three, everybody start singing, and then we'll go through the four songs um, that, that we have planned. And I urge you to go outside and, uh, and, and sing your heart out. And, uh, you know, if you're in town or wherever you're at, try to make a little time to, to, to do that. And, uh, and, and so we're all worshiping together. That's the idea here. Um, it's going to be a lot different Easter than what we're used to. But um, I think we can still honor uh, the Lord with, with our worship and, and, uh, and do our best to, to, to make him happy through it. And uh, so that's what I've got for the announcements. Remember, send me those uh, family messages, and then we'll see you guys in just a few hours to say your section. So I hope you're ready. And, and everybody else, get your Bibles out here. Glenn's got uh, a message from Colossians that uh, he'll get to here in just a second. I've got to flip the mic over, and he'll get started. Good morning. If you've got your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 2, and we're going to pick up with verse number 11. That's the 11th verse of the second chapter of the book of Galatians. I'm going to go ahead and read 
verses 11 through 21. So if you want to read along with me, that would be great. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to coming, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ the minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. This morning we're going to be speaking on the, sub the subject, the dangers of legalism. The dangers of legalism. Now, remember, before we get started, remember the importance of context and that part of the context is the book in which you find the verses. And then the, the purpose of that book or its occasion of writing is a big part of that context. Remember also that the purpose or the reason for Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia um, was that of proclaiming the believer's liberty from religious law and from religious legalism. Galatians has been referred to as the Magna Carta of religious freedom, the battle cry of the Reformation, and the Christian's declaration of independence. I also see it as a six-chapter exposition of Jesus' statement, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, where Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Jesus was speaking to religiously oppressed people when he spoke those words. He was speaking to those who were under the law. And here in the book of Galatians, we have a six chapter exposition of what Jesus was teaching there. Now, a little background um, the churches of Galatia were made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. And they were doing well. Um, they had come to knowledge of the gospel through Paul's ministry. They um, had accepted Christ, many of them, and therefore the church was formed. The churches were formed there in um, Galatia. And they were running well until certain men showed up, it says. And these certain men were men that they had a hard time with just totally abandoning the Mosaic law. They were, they were Jewish um, believers. They were people who had 
believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the new sacrifice for Israel's sin, but they, they held on to the belief that you needed to follow and obey the Mosaic law. And they taught that a Gentile could not become a believer or be saved unless he became a proselyte Jew first. And a big part of that was um, being um, circumcised. So this was the false teaching that was going on. And you got to remember now, um, this is when the church is just beginning. And for years and years and years, the, 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 they were following the law, looking at it as a way to gain righteousness. And, that, and with that, they disliked Gentiles. They did not view Gentiles as God's chosen people. They were referred to them as sinners. And just even accepting the fact that Gentiles would, could be saved was difficult for a lot of the Jewish culture. And so these, these men came who believed that you had to observe the Mosaic law and trust in Christ in order to be saved, and that Gentiles, therefore, had to become um, Jews by way of proselytization um, first, then they could accept Christ, was their teaching. And they were um, messing up things at the church pretty bad, there, or the churches there in Galatia pretty bad. Um, they had a hard time making the change over to freedom. As a matter of fact, this, this first part about them breaking up the, the church and causing the troubles, that's the first danger of legalism. I've never seen a harmonious, legalistic church. I've uh, never seen a legalistic church where they agreed on everything. I've never seen a legalistic church where love abounded. Um, but that's because, number one, legalism breeds hypocrisy. First danger of legalism. Legalism breeds hypocrisy. Verses 11 through 13. He says, but when Cephas, that's Peter, Cephas was his name in Aramaic, Peter in the Greek. Um, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, they, came, they claimed to have come from the apostle James or been sent by him, even though their teaching contradicted what James taught in, in Acts chapter 15. Um, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when these men came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of circumcision. Meaning that before these guys showed up, Peter was cool with everything. He was fellowshipping with the Gentiles, which with, for the Jewish culture was very difficult to accept. And he was eating with them, fellowshipping with them, worshiping with them. Um, he was probably enjoying ribs and chops for the first time in his life. He, wasn't, he was eating dinner with them. He, he, he wasn't picking through what they had to see if it was, was kosher or not. He had um, made that adjustment and, and all these things. But when these legalists showed up, when these Judaizers showed up, and started to put on that legalistic peer pressure, even Peter started to cave. Um, matter of fact, it says that he stopped fellowshipping with the Gentile part of the church and began to withdraw from them and hold himself aloof, hang with the, the, um, the, these Judaizers and eat only kosher foods. And he did it, it tells us, out of fearing the party of the circumcision. <laughs> so Peter's behavior, or his change in behavior, and its motive are not healthy, they're not good. And they were, matter of fact, they were very, very hurtful for the Gentile believers in the churches of Galatia because they had been experiencing a wonderful fellowship in Christ up to that point. But legalism always breeds hypocrisy, and hypocrisy always breeds division. Uh, legalism, it's just, it's dangerous. We, we don't tend to look at legalism as dangerous as, as it is, but it is, and it's powerful. Um, it even swayed the apostle Peter. Um, 
And then we see how it can spread. Verse 13. And the rest of the Jews, the rest of the people who had been converted, the rest of the people who had trusted on Christ, the rest of the people who were fellowshipping with the Gentiles, his brothers, the rest of them did what? Joined him in hypocrisy. With the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Legalism leads to hypocrisy. We'll get to the whys on some of this in a minute, but I did want to throw some stuff in there. Um, it says Peter stood condemned. Condemned doesn't mean like condemned to hell or loss of salvation. What it means is Peter was guilty. And not only guilty of something, but he was guilty of something that he knew better than to do. You ever been there? I have. We've all been there. Given into that peer pressure, make those little jokes, you know, um, but we can't do that. Legalism breeds hypocrisy. And he was caving in, and even if, and if, if he was caving in, and if Barnabas was even pushed to that point, um, we need to watch out for ourselves because anytime you see legalism creep in, that is its result. It breeds hypocrisy. It causes people to put on a show, a holy show, rather than actually live in faith in Christ and exercising the love that the Holy Spirit produces within them. You see, Simon Peter should have known better. Not just should have known better, Simon Peter did know better. You see, because in Acts chapter 2, at the day of Pentecost, when they spoke in tongues and, and everybody from all scattered nations and Gentiles heard the message in their own language, he saw that miracle. He saw the gospel go out not to just the Jewish um, race, he saw the gospel to go out to the nations of the world, Jew and Gentile alike. Um, this is the same Simon Peter who in Acts chapter 10 received a vision of unclean foods coming down on a blanket and he told the Lord, and it said, to, and the Lord said to Peter, kill and eat. And he says, but I have never eaten anything unclean. This happened three times. And the third time God told him, what God has cleansed, do not call unclean. And then we see that Simon Peter actually went to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, preached the gospel to him, saw that they had received the Holy Spirit and been saved, him and his whole house, and he witnessed the salvation of the first Gentiles coming to Christ. And, and he was there for that. And then in chapter 11 of the book of Acts, he explains what his vision meant. He understood it. But that pressure, that pressure, that pressure to be conformed to what some legalist wants you to be because he considers himself holier than you or better than you or at a higher level than you. That's a dangerous pressure. And it breeds hypocrisy. Don't even know if I should tell it, but I'm going to do it anyway. There's a joke, and it kind of displays hypocrisy. The joke goes, you know why you should never take one Baptist fishing? Because he'll drink all your beer. You need to take two Baptist fishing, because then neither one will touch that stuff. Legalism leads to hypocrisy, and hypocrisy is simply, simply play acting. It's trying to appear to be something you are not. So we see how power and influence um, that legalism can be. And a matter of fact, I'd like you to look over to Galatians chapter 5. Just turn over a page or two to Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 9 when we see how just how dangerous and how powerful this spread of hypocrisy can be that's caused by legalism. Act, that is Galatians chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, where it says, listen, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? 
This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. Now listen, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Usually when you hear that term, you'll hear somebody, you know, lots of times go, little leaven leavens, leavens the whole lump of dough. And, and how like, and they start talking about how if you let a little um, wrong in or a little of this in, a little immorality in. And I understand that, that, it, that is wrong, but the, what the leaven here is talking about, the leaven of hypocrisy that comes from legalism. He's talking about you let a little legalism in your church. You let those people who start to want to only eat certain foods, recognize certain days or whatever their hang up is. It doesn't take long before others in the church embrace their beliefs and suddenly you have it spreading through the body of believers and it spreads and leavens like leaven leavens out the whole lump of dough. Legalism is dangerous. And it spreads. It spreads. And in this reference, when he talks about leaven, leaven he is not talking about liberalism. And he's not talking about fleshly indulgence. He's talking about those people that say, if you really want to be a Christian, you need to look like me. You need to dress like me. You need to walk like me, talk like me, act like me. Enjoy the things I enjoy and don't do the things I don't do. Do, do the things I, I do. You've met those people. I've met those people. Here's the difference. Some people are swayed by that. We are to be firmly grounded in the word of God. Not shaken. Not moved. By those people. We are to stick with God's written word. So we see the powerful influence that legalism can have, and it, it generates this hypocrisy. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit more about why it generates this, this hypocrisy in a little bit. But let's understand now, listen, all of us have differing personal convictions in some areas. There are some things that I'll accept that you won't. There are some things that you accept that I, that I won't. You know, we know the clear teachings of Scripture. Stay free from immorality. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, we have a pretty healthy list of, of things that um, we should avoid and things we should embrace. But people are going to have varying, um, varying personal convictions in areas. And that's fine. As long as we keep our personal convictions personal. And we're all at different levels of growth. There are some who have just been saved. Those who have been saved for a long time have way more understanding of God's word and, and they're going to have differing viewpoints on some things. And that's fine. That's what Romans 14 is uh, all about. You need to go back and read Romans 14, by the way. That's what that whole chapter is about. But when you take your personal convictions and you make them a condition to salvation or a condition to maintaining salvation, you have just gone from having a personal conviction to being a false teacher. Because the gospel does not include your personal conviction. So we see how these legalistic ideas can spread. And how they can leaven the whole lump of dough. That's the first danger of legalism. It breeds hypocrisy. And hypocrisy, by the way, leads to factions. Matter of fact, listen, what we just read. It says the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was, car was carried away by their hypocrisy. What do you think happened to the fellowship of that church? That church that was one, that church that was in unity, that church that had good relationships with each other, that church that, where they, the believers loved one another, served with one another. Now you had the Jewish believers sitting on this side and the Gentile believers sitting on this side, and you had cold stares starting to go on in the church because of legalism. <laughs> legalism breeds hypocrisy. And number two, legalism distorts the gospel. Verse 14. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you... 
being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. How is it you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Well, one, let me knock this out of the way real quick. Um, what does he mean there about um, being a Jew, living like a Gentile? He was a Jew who had been living like a Gentile. He had been fellowshipping with the Gentiles, eating at the Gentiles' houses, um, eating food that was prepared by Gentiles and eating unclean food that the Gentiles enjoyed. Um, and now Paul's going, so if you're a Jew and you've been living like a Gentile, why is it you're trying to get the Gentiles to live like a Jew? Why are you getting them to try to take on the law? But the beginning of this, this verse is what I really want to look, look at. And listen, he says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. You see, this is not just a light matter. This is not a small matter. This is not one of those personal conviction things that you can just push to the side. When you make some kind of religious law or religious rule or religious ceremony of any sort part of salvation, you're messing with the gospel. You cannot take from or add to the gospel without changing it into a false gospel. This is foundational. You cannot add to the gospel. Listen, there are two kinds of religion in this world. I know there's many religions, but there's only really two kinds of religion. There is the religion of man's achievement. What he's done through his religious faith, through his um, efforts at being better and better, there is the religion of man's achievement, and then there is the religion of divine accomplishment where God did it all, where Jesus walked up on Golgotha's hill and died on a cross in our place to take on himself our sin debt. You see, to create your own way, to have a religion of man's achievement, even if you couple it with belief in Christ, turns the gospel from a gospel of grace into a gospel of work. And listen to me, grace and works do not go together. Works negate grace. They're opposite. Works leads to you receiving what you've earned. Grace is you receiving what you don't deserve. So, number one, legalism breeds hypocrisy. I've never met a legalist yet with his holier-than-thou kind of stuff that actually lived up to what he believed. Um, it breeds hypocrisy. It causes division, and it distorts the gospel. Works and grace don't work together. And moving on, we see not only does it breed hypocrisy and divide the body and distort the gospel, but legalism, pay real attention here, legalism makes salvation impossible. Verses 15 through 17. Peter, or Paul here says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles, meaning we, we were, you know, Jews by nature, we were brought up in, in, in that atmosphere, and we weren't idolaters like the Gentiles. And then verse 16, though, he says, Nevertheless, listen, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Listen. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if we, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ the minister of sin? May it never be. You see, legalism makes salvation impossible. When you add a law or religious law or religious code or religious rules to, to the gospel, and you say, you've got to do these things in order to be saved, it makes salvation impossible. It makes it unattainable. Um, it, matter of fact, it is 
That is why Jesus said, come to me, ye who are, who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Rest from what? From works. I'll give you rest for your soul. You won't have to live wondering, have you done enough? Have you been good enough? Have you served enough? Have you prayed enough? Have you done enough of everything to make it? And the answer is, you, you, you won't. Because legalism makes salvation impossible. No one's able to be saved through obedience to the law or a set of religious rules. You know why? A couple reasons. Number one is because you can't keep it. Nobody lives up to a code. Nobody lives up to a code. If you say, well, I have, you are one self-deceived individual. Um, no one, no one is able to live up to the law. Matter of fact, that's what Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 tell us. Listen, it says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, meaning us, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We cannot obey the law. We can't live up to all the demands. We can't do it, which leads to the second reason no flesh will be justified by the law, and that is that we are not just guilty of sinning. We're guilty because we're sinners. It's just not just what we do, it's not just what we've done, but the problem is who we are, who we are inside. Jesus tried to make us see that when he taught about things of the heart, when he said, you've heard it, or you've read, thou shalt not commit murder, but I tell you, whoever hates his brother has committed murder in his heart. And when he said, Thou, you've read, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you look at a woman for to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already. Jesus was saying, look, it's not just your actions. It's not just your conduct. You've got a bigger problem than what you do. It's what causes you to, you to do what you do. And that is the fact that you're born sinful. You have a sinful nature. We're sinful on the inside. Ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden, Man has been bent, born with a bent towards evil and away from God. I was speaking with someone not long ago, and they were talking about how people are basically good, and how babies, you know, um, when they're, you know, they're born and they're little, and how they're so innocent, and how they're kind. And I just looked at her and said, yeah, and it doesn't take them long before they learn to ball up their little fist and hit you in the face. It doesn't take them long to learn to pitch a fit. Listen, we're born sinners, and we have a bigger problem than just what we've done. It's, the problem is we are born with a sinful nature, a bent toward that which is evil, a bent away from God, a bent to satisfy the flesh. So it makes it impossible. Now I want you to stop for a second and think about this. Verse 16, towards the end he says, listen, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Think about the reality of that. It's, that's an intense statement. If you, if you take this and look at it, since by the works of the law, no flesh, nobody will just be justified. Think then, what is the result of those who try to earn salvation who try to gain salvation through observing religious rules, laws, and ordinances. Their only result is failure in an area you do not want to fail. We're talking about the difference between life and death. We're talking about the difference between eternal life and eternal death. We're talking the difference between heaven and hell. And th so those who try to earn their way, who try to do whatever their religion requires of them, because... You see, when it says here works of the law, it's talking about the Mosaic law, but it applies to every single religious or re kind of law that men um, 
think up it, it, it's, it's not just the Mosaic law. It's um, whatever your religion has placed the Mosaic law with, whatever kind of law they have come out with on their own. And no flesh, no flesh will be justified by works of the law. That's a pretty scary thing. That's a pretty intense, intense reality. But it's a, it's a reality that must be embraced legalism breeds hypocrisy which causes division legalism distorts the gospel legalism makes salvation impossible not difficult not hard to achieve impossible the word says over and over and over again that by the works of the law no flesh will be justified and then the next danger of legalism is legalism will take you backward. Legalism will take you backward. Verses 18 and 19. Paul says, For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For, though the, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. What does this mean that through the law, he died to the law. Well, he explains a little bit, a little further um, in the third chapter of this book of Galatians, verses 24 through 26. He says, he's speaking of the law. Let's start with verse 23. He says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Listen, therefore the law has become our tutor or our teacher, our instructor, to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He said elsewhere, he, Paul said elsewhere, he said, I would have not known sin, I would have not known I was a sinner if it wasn't for the law. The, the law was never intended as a vehicle by which we gain righteousness. The law was there to make us see our guilt, and our guilt was to cause us to turn to Christ and put our faith in his death for us. So when we start embracing the law, when we start embracing this thing of observing days or ordinances or food restrictions or any of these things as part of salvation, we're moving backward. We're not moving ahead. And if Paul said, if I embrace, if I put back together, if I rebuild what I once destroyed, meaning faith in the law, he says, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Why would I go backward? Why would I take these things on? Legalism breeds hypocrisy. Legalism causes division. Legalism distorts the gospel. Legalism makes salvation impossible. Legalism is moving, is moving backward. And listen, legalism nullifies grace. Legalism nullifies, cancels out, gets rid of grace because it's one or the other. It cannot be grace plus works. It cannot be grace plus our pious, religious, whatever you want to call it. It, it is, it, they don't work together. Legalism nullifies grace. Verses 20 and 21. For I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Listen, Paul says of himself, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, through any religious law, any set of religious rules, if, if, if righteousness can be gained through our own human effort, then Christ died needlessly does that make sense that makes sense jesus why would christ hang on a cross die a sacrificial substitutionary death 
hang there in agony and misery, go through what he went through, if there was some other way for us to be saved. As far as I'm concerned, legalism also steals his glory because it belittles his grace and what he did to save us. I'm going to read some verses that are very familiar to most people. I'm reading from Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Listen to me. Speaking of Christ, it says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we, uh, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed, meaning the healing of the soul. Let me read it to you this way, and tell, tell me if you like how this, this goes. Let's start it. Let's read verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by our own efforts we are healed. That does not work. That, that, that just doesn't, I'm, that doesn't work. That's not in the message of the Bible. Anybody who claims that their message is from the Bible, but they have a list of rules or religious um, ordinances or whatever to gain salvation or in order to maintain your salvation that's like reading these verses the way i just read them you you don't say he was pierced for our transgressions and by my own efforts i am healed it cannot be verse 20 of that book the second chapter of the book of galatians he explains to us the gospel it's amazing this thing about Christ taking on our sin debt and that he, by his scourging we are healed. Paul put it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. Meaning when Christ hung on that cross, he took upon himself our sin debt. He took upon himself our sin. He took upon himself all those things. He, 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 so to the extent that Paul says, the person that I was, God identified with Christ on the cross. He said, he didn't say Jesus was crucified on the cross at this point. He says, I was crucified. I have been crucified with Christ. My old man, who I was, the sinner I was, God identified that reprobate with his son on the cross. And Jesus died to pay for that reprobate sin. And we are cleansed from our sin by the shed blood of Christ. We've been crucif crucified with Christ. And, and here's the, listen, and next he says, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. A lot of people don't understand the full extent of the salvation process. They think of it as forgiveness of sin, but the salvation, of the salvation process is not just for forgiveness of sin. Listen, we do not just preach a gospel of, of forgiveness, we preach a gospel of forgiveness and regeneration, rebirth. When Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, this is what he's talking about. When a person realizes they are sinful, realizes they are guilty before God, and then they look to God and they understand from God's word, that God loves them anyway, so much so that he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ and he lived a sinless life and he died on the cross to pay their sin debt and you believe that and you accept that for your own personally, just you and God, you and the Lord, and you say, please forgive me of what I've done, forgive me of what I am. God, I don't want to be what I am anymore, but I believe you love me and I believe Jesus died for me. And I ask you to save my soul. At that moment, you are saved, you are redeemed, you are forgiven, and you are born again. And you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God from that point on. That's what 
That's what Paul's talking about when he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He lives in us by way of the indwelling Holy Spirit. We are, we are redeemed, made new, born again, made new creatures at the moment that we accept Christ. Matter of fact, that's what it's talking about in Romans 8.1 when we talked about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. He's talking about those who are born again. Those who didn't turn to religion, those who didn't turn to other people or their own efforts or try, try to earn their way there, but the person who realizes that they are a sinner and they realize that our God loves them and they realize that Jesus died for them and they put their faith in him. They believe on his name. At that moment, they're saved. That's what the Bible teaches. It tells us what the gospel is. It says it clearly that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, and then the third day he rose again from the dead. And he died for us and that we accept him by faith. We're saved by grace through faith and not by works. And when that person, when a person does that, he's born again, he's made new. The Holy Spirit abides within him, within him from that day on, seals him unto the day of redemption. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, setting us free from the law of sin and death. So, when you run into legalists, when, when there's the guy that tells you, you got to look like me, talk like me, walk like me, you've got to observe the ordinances I observe. And, and we see this all over the place. You've seen people. i got to be a little careful. But I, I, I always get worried when I see people from a certain church or whatever, and they're all dressed the same. They all look the same. They're all wearing the same clothes. You know, it makes me go, wow, something is So, beware legalism. Don't let legalism exist in the body of believers where you, you attend. Don't let legalism spread like it will because legalism breeds hypocrisy. Legalism <laughs> causes division. Legalism distorts the gospel. Legalism makes salvation impossible. Legalism is moving backward and legalism nullifies grace and it is by grace that we are saved not uh, not by works lest any man should boast i hope that if you're watching if you've never accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior if you've been counting on your religion counting on your religious practice counting on your do good things whatever I hope you come to understand that that's not from the Bible. That's not what the scriptures teach. It may be what some of the writings of your church teaches, but it's not what the Bible teaches. I, ad I advise you to believe the word of God and put your, put your trust in the Lamb of God who took upon himself the sin of the world. And if you will turn to him personally, Confess your sin to him and ask him to save you. He will, because that's what the Bible teaches. It says, for whosoever, that includes you, it says, for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John chapter 1 tells us that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believe on his name. Philippian jailer asked that all-important question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And his answer was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Saved by grace. And saved through faith. And not through, and 